Um, I am Heather Gallagher. I'm a naturalist here at the Nature Center, and I have had a relationship with Adventure Science Center and Barnard Seyfert Astronomical Society uh, for 21 years. We uh, host star parties together. Actually, they do all the work. We just do the registrations. But we have enjoyed being a night sky um, observing place for many, many people um, throughout, throughout the years. Um, I'm glad you could join us. This virtual program is made possible because of a strong partnership between Warner Park Nature Center, which is a Metro Parks and Recreation facility, and Friends of Warner Parks, our nonprofit organization, and of course our fabulous Nature Center staff. If you've never been on Zoom before, sorry guys, we gotta do this because we might have some newbies. I gotta teach my mom how to use Zoom tonight, so don't even go there. During this webinar, you're gonna be able to see and hear whoever is speaking at the time. I've got it on gallery view right now, but I'm gonna switch it over so you only see Theo or you only see me when we're speaking. We can't see you. So please use the um, options at the bottom that I shared with you. If you take your cursor and hover over the bottom of the screen, you can see Q&A. You see options like reactions. You can raise your hand, you can clap. Um, and you can also put stuff in the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring these throughout the presentation and I'll try to answer your questions as they are relevant to what we're talking about at that moment. Otherwise, I'm gonna hold your questions to the end of the presentation. And I'll give you information of how you can contact our astronomer at the end of the, the presentation if you have more questions. If for some reason you're kicked off the webinar, call the Nature Center. 8628555 area code 615 and we'll do our best to help you but also just close everything down and restart it with the same link i'm sure that you'll pop right back in if you're unable to see or hear the presentation again call the nature center cami claybrook who you can see um, up right now she is our tech support and by the way cami is the person who also does a lot of really great stuff in Warner Parks. So everybody should clap for her right now. Um, she is going to answer the phone. She's going to be helping with questions and she can help you get back on our Zoom uh, program today. She will totally support you. Again, this presentation is gonna last about 30 minutes, but I bet you guys are gonna have a lot of observation and a lot of questions. So we'll probably go to 1045 or 11 o'clock and we'll be answering your questions and trying to provide the best answers we can during the presentation. I would now like to introduce my friend and an awesome astronomer, former planetarium um, assistant director at uh, Adventure Science Center. She's an ambassador for dark skies as well as the solar system. And she was very instrumental in bringing the solar eclipse um, alive here in Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky. Theo Wellington. All right, y'all can hear me okay? All right, uh, yeah, let's get started here because we're gonna go pretty fast through the solar system. And we're gonna start with the sun, right? We draw it as this cool, round, happy ball in the sky. Um, we can't look at the sun with our eyes, please don't try. So we never really see it except as a big glare. But you know what? If we could see it the way our spacecraft do, we'd probably be scared all the time. It really is a huge seething ball of very, very hot gas. The sun does rotate. It takes about 26 and a half days to turn around. Sunspots and flares come and go. So it's a very dynamic, always changing environment. This is the highest resolution video. We just got this in. We have a brand new solar telescope in Hawaii. That's a region that is 5,000 miles across. Hot boiling gas on an epic scale. Each of those boiling bubbles is about the size of a state. So it's not quite your boiling pot on the oven. The sun is most of the stuff in the solar system, 99.8%. Planets get formed from the leftover bits after you make a star. The surface that we see is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Way down in the center though, 27 million degrees. It's big compared to us, although not to other stars. The sun in this picture is a dot. Stars get really, really, really big. 
If we put the even larger bright red star in Orion, Betelgeuse, right where the sun is, we'd be standing inside it. So we really do have a nice, not too hot, well-behaved star. But now, let's move out on our walking tour of the solar system. So we're starting at the sun in the solar system walk at the Nature Center, which is located right next to the telephone pole in front of the Nature Center. Imagine the sun is the size of a bowling ball, and we're going to walk 11 paces to Mercury. Now this sounds really easy, but guys, each of these 11 paces is 3.7 million miles. So walk your 11 paces and let's hear about Mercury. All right, so first of all, what does this look like? And you can put your responses in the chat. You know, it's a kind of a gray ball. It's got some craters on it. Yeah, it does look like the moon, but... And actually, if we had the far side of the moon up here, it would make it even a better comparison. But this is actually Mercury, and that's what the Earth's moon looks like next to it. So it's just a bit bigger than the moon, and it lacks those cool, large, dark areas of our own moon, but it does have a lot of craters just the same. Mercury spins really slowly, taking about 59 days, but it whips around the sun every 88 days. So... Look at the arrow there to see which way you'd be facing and kind of watch how that goes as Mercury goes around in orbit. If you were a well-insulated tourist, you could stand in some places, watch the sun come up, then move backwards and set, then rise again to go across the sky. Noon to noon ends up being 176 days. That's weird. It's both hot and cold, right? When you're facing the sun, it's pretty hot as you would expect. But with no atmosphere to hold in the heat, the night side of Mercury is bone-chillingly cold. Now, some deep craters at the north and south poles of Mercury never see sunlight, so they're permanently in a deep freeze. When we look at the bottoms of these craters with radar from Earth, we see bright reflections from the shadows that look like frozen water. Water and ice on Mercury. And um, just as a sad sort of reflection, those radar images were done by the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, which has now reached the end of its life. That's sad. All right. So a planet has craters and valleys and mountains. What do you call them? Who gets to name all that stuff? For each planet, there's a naming scheme run by the International Astronomical Union. It takes years to name every feature, but on Mercury, the valleys are named for ancient or abandoned cities on Earth. Well, it's getting a bit hot here at Mercury though, so let's take a few more steps to our next planet. Can you pause that for just a second, Theo? We've got a really good question. Let me see um, if I can, how do I do that? That's a good question. How do so I pause? Just go ahead and let it run, it's cool. Okay. Why is the Puerto Rico telescope at the end of its life? Ah, that is a good question. And the answer is that the instruments, the, the telescope itself is a giant dish, but the instruments sit up above that dish and they're held in place by awesome, they call them wires, okay, but they are this thick and they weigh seven tons a piece. One of them broke uh, earlier this fall. And okay, one breaks, that's okay, sort of. And they were in the process of ordering and getting a replacement for that when a second one unexpectedly broke. This puts strain on the rest of the wires that nobody can measure. And if one of those breaks and a human being is in the way of that wire, it will kill you. So it's not safe. And it's 50 years old. So all they can really do now is try to disassemble it in a way that doesn't catastrophically take out other stuff around it. So it's really, really sad. Um, it does things no other telescope on the planet can do. So write your congressman and ask them, please, can we replace this? But um, it's going to be a while before we can, you know, think about doing that. The reason it was in Puerto Rico is it, the bowl shape of this valley. It's limestone, um, just like here in Middle Tennessee, where you have sinkholes. So this was a giant sinkhole that was a good shape to put a telescope in of this kind. So that's kind of a fun fun fact about that. Um, 
So it's just, it's really sad, but there's really nothing in an engineering sense that can be done. Um, things degrade over time and there's just no safe way to, to uh, repair it at the moment. By the way, the instrument package up top weighs 900 tons. So that's not something that you can just kind of either helicopter off or do anything like that with. So sad, but that's, that's why we did it. That's why we built it there. And that's why it, it's um, going to be taken apart at the moment. So we start no, no. at the sun and then we went to Mercury. Does anybody know what our next planet is? Right after Mercury, we have Earth's twin, Venus. Let's hear about Venus. All right. So Venus is named after the goddess of love and beauty. Shrouded in clouds that reflect sunlight and make Venus the brightest natural object in the sky after the sun and moon. Now here on Earth, clouds are water vapor. Venus is the same size as Earth, just a little closer to the sun than we are. So we imagined it being wet, warm, and swamp. If the clouds were water, the planet had to be some kind of steamy jungle. Maybe it had dinosaurs. But from 1962 to 64, we finally reached the planet, made some good measurements, and found, wow, a hot, baked, barren landscape. Venera 9 sent back this extreme fisheye in 1975, and some uh, clever photographers sort of unwrapped that and added color. So taking the fisheye out, that's kind of what it looks like, just under 900 degrees, day and night. Wow, that's right, hotter than mercury. The clouds that hold in the heat, turns out, are mostly sulfuric acid. The atmosphere is almost all carbon dioxide. Really no water, no swamps, and sadly no dinosaurs. Venus rotates backward from the other planets, or you could look at it as upside down, and very, very slowly. One rotation takes 243 days, but the year is 225. Definitely not Kansas. We can't see through those clouds in visible light, so we took a radar to Venus to map it through the clouds. The first thing we noticed is that there are very, very few craters, but there are some funny looking mountains. This is an enormous five mile high shield volcano named Mat Mons after an Egyptian goddess. Features on Venus, with only a few exceptions, are named for women, both mythological and real. Is this an active volcano? We don't know. Maybe. We need to go back, maybe to the surface with really sturdy landers. It's hot enough to melt lead on the surface. As seen from Earth, Venus goes through phases and changes size quite a bit. And at crescent phase, it's on our side of the sun and so near the Earth, large and bright. Lovely in the sky, it's kind of a cosmic joke that we named this planet after the goddess of beauty, but it's really kind of an ugly place to be. So like Earth in size, but our histories have been very different. Speaking of Earth, let's take a few more steps. Okay, so we are going to walk eight paces to Earth. I hope you like my uh, Smithsonian solar system shirt there. Um, Theo, let's hear about Earth. Yeah, the Earth, third rock from the sun and the moon. You know, we have so much going for us. Earth's 23 and a half degree tilt gives us seasons. The magnetic field protects us from radiation. The atmosphere holds in the warmth of the day just enough. And we're the first planet we've walked to that has a natural satellite, a moon. We call it the moon, but it's also a moon. Well, what's wrong with this picture? You know, this is the classic textbook picture, and they are the correct scale relative to each other. Yeah, it does look like there's a pretty little hurricane in this picture. I should look up what day this particular image was taken. All right, so what's wrong with this is scale. If the moon were this close to Earth, it'd be really scary. It's actually a really long way out to the moon, okay, 250,000 miles. And on our solar system walk scale, two and a half inches away, okay? So it's really, really close in one sense, but really, really far in actual space. The moon has been an inspiration, large enough and close enough to study even before we had telescopes. 
The curve of the Earth's shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse allowed us to figure out the size and distance of the moon. And the moon has been our calendar since time out of mind, the phases marking the passage of each moon, right? We've used it to hunt, to harvest, to play, and to navigate. We have poetry, songs, art, so much inspired by the moon. It would not be Earth without the moon. It's also our first small step in our real life walk or space travel through the solar system. But now let's take our first next our next steps. Okay, anybody know the next planet after Earth? I can tell you the last two nights here in uh, in Nashville, it has been super -de duper red in the sky. Did you notice that too, Theo? Yep, it, it looked real pretty. It, it has been gorgeous. Okay, so Melissa says Mercury. Anybody have an idea? What is the next planet after Earth if you're going away from the sun? Tiffany says Mercury. I think we already visited Mercury. It was the closest to the sun. Anybody else have a guess? The next planet, oh, we've got an answer from Melissa and Daphne and Jennifer. They say Mars. Let's hear about Mars. Yeah. Mars is the planet named for the god of war on account of its red color. And so take a look at it, like Heather said, here in the night sky in November 2020 and see if you agree. Now, it's about half the size of Earth. But it has just as much land as we do because there's no oceans. Nonetheless, when we looked at Mars through telescopes, we saw a world that reminded us of Earth in some ways more than Venus. There are polar ice caps that grow and shrink with the seasons, occasional clouds, a day that it's 24 and a half hours long. Not one, but two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Fear and panic, that kind of goes along with the whole Mars God of War thing. Although they're kind of irregular asteroids, they're not round moons. Now, we didn't really see water except for the ice caps, so was Mars dry with life struggling to survive? Visual observations before cameras drew lines, canali, all over the planet. Maybe these carried water. Maybe the Martians would invade for our water. The famous War of the Worlds radio broadcast convinced a lot of people that indeed Mars could invade. With cameras, though, we really weren't seeing much water or much atmosphere. So we sent the spacecraft. What did we see? Ooh, craters. It actually looked a lot like the moon, except a little more red. No aliens. Boy, were we disappointed. And yet, we went back again, and in the end, we've realized it's a whole lot more interesting than we thought. All right, so here we are in our Martian flyer. We're moving over the surface of Mars. Mars has dust devils that are five miles high planet-wide dust storms, giant volcanoes up to 16 miles high. We're flying toward the biggest canyon, the Valles Marineris, which dwarfs our own Grand Canyon. It's four times as deep with a span that would cross the entire U.S. Whoa, it's a huge, huge canyon. Now, unlike our own Grand Canyon, which was cut by the Colorado River, this is a giant crack. You can drop the whole Los Angeles basin right into it. There are many features on Mars, though, that do look like they were formed by water. So maybe Mars was more like Earth in the distant past. Could it have had life? Is life still hiding underground? To find out, we have invaded Mars. This would be a fun flight, by the way. It's a lot more fun than flying over the Death Star. So we've sent orbiters and seven landers to send back amazing images of a world many of us would like to visit. More are on the way. The new rover Perseverance is more than halfway to Mars. It will land February the 18th, 2021, about noon, so you can watch live as we land in an ancient river delta. And bonus, we're taking a cute little helicopter drone as well. Its name is Ingenuity. All right. We don't know when people will invade, but stay tuned. So meanwhile, what's all that up ahead? Okay. So 
we've gone from the sun to Mercury to Venus to Earth to Mars. Before we get to the next planet of the nine that we're visiting today, we're actually going to come upon something that's pretty interesting. And that is 37 paces from Mars. So if you're outside walking with me, check it out. You could be Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon and you are coming upon an asteroid field. Yeah, whoa, the asteroid belt. So here we are, yeah, driving our Millennium Falcon and having to duck and dodge and move around. And actually, what would the view look like if you were standing on an asteroid? Uh, space. The sun would be just a bright shard of light in the sky, and you wouldn't see anything else. Space is mostly empty space. The average distance between any two asteroids in the main belt is 600,000 miles. So there are a lot of asteroids, but there's also a whole lot of space. We've flown spacecraft right through the asteroid belt, and unless you're aiming for one, you're not going to hit anything. Now, most asteroids are in the space between Mars and Jupiter, and they range in size from Ceres and Vesta to bits of dust. Some of those find their way to Earth as meteorites. Jupiter's gravity kept all these bits from forming a planet, and today it still stirs the pot enough to kick some of these our way. Look at all these near-Earth objects. We call them NEOs. This looks scary. That's a lot of stuff. But remember, space is really, really big, so most of the time there is zero chance of getting hit. And at the present time, none of any size are a threat. Now, of course, there are things that can wake you up. This bus-sized rock broke up over Chelyabinsk, Russia. Or you might find a dent in your roof that looks suspiciously like a crater. Hey, Heather, is it time for our first poll? Yes, it is, but I have to ask you this first. I heard growing up that if you're somewhere really dark, you can actually see the asteroid belt. Is that possible? No. But in a, in a sort of broader sense, it kind of sort of is. So if you're in someplace really dark, particularly in the spring and the fall, sunlight will light up the tiny bits of dust that are in the plane of the solar system. And we call that effect zodiacal light. I've personally only seen it once. And that was because I was on a mountaintop in Chile under very dark skies. But it is, I have seen pictures of it taken here in the United States. But yeah, you have to actually be under dark skies, but it's kind of cool. It's this cone of light that comes up from the horizon and it's clearly following the same path that the sun, moon, and planets do. And a fun fact on that is that a certain popular rock star named Brian May actually did his PhD dissertation on zodiacal light and the dust in the, in the solar system. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's, you can't really see asteroids. Now we're gonna talk in a minute about one time when you might see them, but you'll never see them as anything more than a point of light. So it's really hard to see them. They're really, really small. But, you know, with a telescope, you can watch this dot go deep, 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 deep across the screen. So before we move to the outer planets, Theo and I have a question for you. Can you take this poll? We want to know what you guys have observed. Now, this is a fun poll because you, can't, you don't have to just say one thing. Like, I saw a shooting star last week, which I did. It was really cool. You can say many things. Oh, my gosh, Theo, they're already responding. So 100% say the solar eclipse in 2017. Oh, we have 33% seeing Halley's Comet in 86. People love the full moon. They love a lunar eclipse. Uh, Saturn through a telescope. I told you about somebody I know seeing Saturn through a telescope and the first thing that he did was look around the back side of the telescope and said that's a picture and I said well who took the picture uh, Mars rover in HD a shooting star or a meteor and the sun through a solar viewing telescope oh we've got lots of people raising their hands if you have a story to share now is the time to do that in the chat and we will get to your stories I'm going to end the polling now 
And oh my gosh, two biggest things. Theo, can you see that? The solar eclipse in 2017 and a shooting star. Wonderful. Oh, excuse me. And a full moon. Everybody loves a full moon. You just, you just gotta. You gotta. Yep. Whoa, there we go. So, wow. I actually saw a shooting star just last night. Um, and I wasn't looking for it, but that's why you should always be looking up. Um, I did see a question. Oh, we're going to hold that to the end. Okay. So let's see if we can. Okay. Get on your walking shoes. Yep. It's time to walk. We are going 73 paces to the biggest planet of our solar system. Are you ready? 73 paces. And remember that each of these paces oh, in yeah. the solar system represents 3.7 million miles. This is a long way. Are we ready? Okay, before we do that, just a real quick, so if you want to see an asteroid, hang on, wait for it, April 13th, 2029, okay? This asteroid, Apophis, which is named for an Egyptian god, which is really cool, is going to give us a, a close shave only 19,000 miles away. Uh, we, we will have star parties for this. Now, here in the U.S., close approach happens during the day, but we will see it both the night before and after. It won't hit, okay? No hits. But the cool thing about this is, and let's see if this will play for you. Oh, there's a, there's a scale there of how big it is on, you know, the scale of other relative objects. If this did hit, it would leave a mark. This is bigger than what made the crater in Arizona. Um, but as it goes around the sun, it's kind of fun. Let's see if this will restart. There we go. You can see the asteroid in purple. It's going to come right by the Earth right there, and see how the line changes? We're going to change its orbit. And we'll have to do some figuring afterwards to make sure it's not going to hit us in a future time around. Spoiler, probably not. Okay, and we've actually gone and picked up pieces of asteroids lately. So the Japanese spacecraft Hayabusa 2 went to Ryugu here, and it's going to bring back pieces here in December. Uh, OSIRIS-REx, the U.S. mission, will come back in September with pieces of little tiny Bennu. All right. But now, yeah, you better have your walking shoes on because we got a, some walking to do. Whee! You'll notice that this is the entrance drive to the Nature Center. There is an incomplete solar system walk that was installed by a junior Girl Scout troop back in 2006, sponsored by Barnard Safer Astronomical Society. If you choose to do this, I do have some literature that you can take along with you, so just let me know and I can email that to you. Um, but I do really strongly um, caution you because there's lots and lots of traffic along the entrance drive to the nature summit. All right. So where did all that walking get us? Who's this? I know you guys know this one. All right. Yeah, Jupiter, right? This is the king of the planets, named for the king of the gods. What is different about this planet? I mean, there's no surface seen here, right? Venus had clouds. This is nothing but. We're still trying to figure out if there is ever a solid surface, although the pressure gets high pretty fast. Yeah, it has a storm. Yeah, that red thing there. Actually, even some of those little things are storms, but the great red spot, right? Astronomers name things like what they look like, right? It's a storm that we've been watching for over 300 years. It's a little smaller than it used to be, but it's still bigger than Earth. Now, we have a spacecraft at Jupiter right now, and we flew right over it. That's a mere 5,000 miles above the cloud tops. Boy, does that look pretty cool. Jupiter is so large that it outweighs the entire rest of the solar system. In fact, by more than twice that, the weight. So it's got so much stuff that between the gravity of the sun and Jupiter, it moves the sun, right? If you were somewhere else in the universe, you'd know the sun had at least one planet by watching the sun wobble about this point. 
That's actually how we find planets around other stars. Jupiter also rotates fast in only 10 hours. Compare that to Jupiter's pokey slow 24 hours. That makes for a lot of fun weather and amazing differences in the rotation of the atmosphere belts on the planet. Voyager 1 showed us this for the very first time. But wait, there's more. Four large moons and a whole pile of little ones. What do you think they look like? So 40 years ago, our best guess was, we have a moon? Maybe they look like our moon. But when we actually visit planets, we get surprised. So here's Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. None of them look like the moon, not really. A total of 79 now for Jupiter, although many are just small, irregular rocks. One last surprise was that Jupiter has rings. But like seeing dust in the sunlight coming through a window, you have to get just the right angle. We can't see them from Earth. But the Voyager spacecraft had just the right angle as it was leaving Jupiter. And yeah, and that's fun. Callisto is actually takes the prize for the most cratered surface in the entire solar system. So <laughs> that poor moon has gotten hit a lot. But speaking of going places, we have to move on. This is no joke. We are leaving Jupiter, and this is actually the stone along the solar system walk for Jupiter. We are going to walk to our next planet. Are you ready? Do you know our next planet? We're going to walk 112 paces. If you know the name of our next planet, yes, it does have rings. Please put that in the chat. It's a long way. But hey, it's a nice day outside, so it's a good day to do this. She's almost there. She's looking for the stone. There we are. So yeah, Saturn. How many of you out there have seen this planet through a telescope? I hope a lot of you have. It's the coolest thing you can see in a telescope, really. Hopefully, we'll be able to show you this in person late next summer. This is the last planet that we can see with just our eyes. But for centuries, the thing that really makes this planet special was hidden from view, because all it looked like was another one of the dots bright in the sky. Those thin but beautiful rings that, from our point of view, go from looking edge on to face on over several years. And it really is all about the rings. We had a spacecraft named Cassini observing Saturn for 10 years. Look at how much detail there is in the rings when you're right there. Now, just like with Jupiter, there were some more surprises. More moons. Again, mostly they don't look like our moon. There are 82 at last count, so right now Saturn's winning the moon count contest. Two are particularly interesting. Now Cassini carried a lander to make a brief exploration of that fuzzy orange moon, Titan. It's larger than Mercury. It's the only moon in the solar system with an atmosphere. 94% nitrogen, Earth is 78%. Except that way out here in the solar system, the temperature is minus 292 degrees. This is not CGI. This is the movie the spacecraft made landing on a surface we had never seen. Heading through the methane haze, it came out of the clouds above a landscape that was kind of familiar. It had mountains and valleys, except bathed in an orange light. Sunlight interacts with the methane in the atmosphere to form a hydrocarbon haze, kind of like a bad air day in Los Angeles. Watch the landing. We think the ground here was a bit squishy, so we kind of slid, bounced, the dust clears, Whoa. Watch the parachute shadow go over. That's super cool. The hot air made the picture riffle. We had a lamp turned on because we didn't really know how dark it was going to be. Looked back up. Watch the dew fall. Boom. And then we looked up to see if we could find the sun. And I tell you, the sun is this really faint thing right here. Every picture you ever see an artist make of this shows 
Saturn in the sky of Titan, really huge, and sadly you can't see it. Dead gummit. The moon Enceladus was super unexpected. Fountains of water and organics coming out of this moon, hinting at an under the ice ocean. Habitable? Maybe. Stay tuned. Turning outward once again, get on those hiking boots because it's getting longer between planets. So we're leaving from Saturn and we're going to walk 274 paces to Uranus. I want to advise you if you have small children, Roger, if you're going to walk this with your boys, think about a pace is like uh, a yard and a half. It's a little, it's, it's not exactly for little feet. So you're going to have to walk a little bit further, but 274 paces to Uranus. Here in a second, you're going to see exactly where Uranus is on the entrance drive. Do you guys, do you guys recognize this right outside the nature center? Um, it's going to be right before you turn into the nature center drive. So it's really easy to spot. And uh, I'm ready to learn a little bit more about Uranus. All right, so Heather's finally getting there. And yeah, it's right, right kind of at the intersection there where it is. So it's a long walk. And yet we're only about halfway distance wise through our solar system. She's going to find the rock. And here we are. We did have an interesting you know, question. Um, Theo, I, I went ahead and answered it, but, but someone huh. asked about how many planets have astronauts actually visited? That, I thought that was a, a, a good question. And maybe we could talk about um, how long it would take to get to some of these planets. It is a great question, and you know, a lot of kids that I would talk to in the planetarium were pretty sure we'd been other places because Star Wars, right? Um, actually, the only place we have landed in person is the moon. It's a three-day trip out, three-day trip back, and then however long you want to stay there, you got to take all the stuff for that. So that's where we've been. We haven't been anywhere else. So the challenge is human beings are not, you know, we're not made for space flight. We're needy things. We need atmosphere. We need water. We need food. We need a bathroom, you know. So there are things we need, and it's hard to take all that stuff with us. Now, we've been learning how to live in space in the International Space Station, but otherwise we haven't been anywhere because we actually haven't figured out how to do it. We're looking at going back to the moon and on to Mars. Now, Mars, you know, the nice thing about the moon is it stays the same distance from us. But you have to remember the planets are in motion. So Mars, for example, we lap Mars every two years, and that's when we're close. But then another year and a bit later, we're all the way across the solar system from each other. So if you go to Mars, you might have to go when we lap once, and you won't be able to come back for two years until we lap each other again. So that's a long time in space, a long time out from our radiation protection, and a lot of stuff you're going to have to take with you. So we are working really hard to figure out how to do that because we want to do that. But in many ways, to, recreate, to go somewhere, you have to take a tiny little ecosystem, your own personal Earth, with you, which is kind of tough. All right. Okay, so the pronunciation of the seventh planet. The reason why we say Uranus is because that pronunciation has fewer jokes. Um, eighth graders will always say it the other way, but that's okay. It's a Greek word, and so the actual pronunciation in Greek is really odd, and none of us can recreate it, but Uranus is as good as it gets. It's not really very interesting. I mean, you look at that, that's kind of a bland ball, right? It's no fun after the enormous storms of Jupiter and those huge rings of Saturn. It is a star in our sky, and under a really dark sky, it's just at the limits of visibility. You can probably find it in binoculars here in Nashville. But it moves so slowly that we really just didn't notice it moving against the background of stars. Now, it was discovered by William Herschel in 1781. A high haze of methane kind of obscures what's going on underneath. So we look at it in the infrared right, in the long wavelengths that see through some of the top clouds, and then it starts to look more like the other gas planets. 
What else do you see in that picture? Yeah, rings, and also a few moons. None of them are very large, but there are 27 that we know of, named for characters from Shakespeare and Alexander Pope. Astronomers kind of are fun people. We like to try out different naming schemes. Now, what else? Now, we did not tip this picture just to fit, okay? This is actually how Uranus is. It rolls along, tipped over at greater than 90 degrees. And yeah, those red, we think, are storms, right? They're showing up as warmer than the rest of the atmosphere around it. So imagine warm air kind of coming up through the core there. All right. Now, Uranus is weird in a lot of ways. Not only is the rotation tilted, and so is the magnetic field, except at a different angle. So no one knows for certain, but it looks like Uranus took a huge hit at some point that knocked it onto its side. So rolling along in its orbit also means that the North Pole is in sunlight for a quarter of the 84-year orbit, and then in darkness for another quarter. So that's seasons on steroids. Now it's a gas planet, but it's not quite the giant that Saturn and Jupiter are. It has a different mix of gases, okay? Saturn and Jupiter are mostly hydrogen with a little bit of helium, and then just a smattering of other things that gives them their colors. But Uranus and Neptune too are both are more hydrogen, helium, and some methane gas, also some water and ammonia. Now ices are listed in the competition composition there, but that doesn't imply cold, just solid. It's hard for us to imagine things like ammonia and water being solid, but not cold. But under pressure, you can do that. Is it getting longer between planets? Boy, we better start heading out to our next destination. So from the Nature Center Uranus Stone, you're going to cross the Nature Center Drive and do so carefully because we got a lot of traffic today. And then walk, I got to look this one up, 307 paces to our next planet. And I'm not going to tell you this one. If you know the next planet after Uranus, go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll see you in a minute. That's a long walk. Yeah, look out for traffic. Tiffany has answered Neptune. Roger and the boys have answered Neptune. Did they have to tell you that, Roger? Or did you already <laughs> know Neptune? That's my question. So we are headed on out to the god of the ocean, Neptune. Pretty exciting. Uh, Roger says they told me. <laughs> <laughs> If you're uh, looking for where Neptune is along the Nature Center Drive, I don't believe this stone is there anymore. It might be, but it's underneath the sugar maple tree um, as you get close to the overflow parking lot. And again, I can send, I can email the information about each of the planets that, that Theo is sharing as well as the paces. Just let me know. Cool. Well, that was a longer walk. All right, Neptune, whose deep blue color earned it its name from the Roman god of the sea, right? It's almost, although not quite, a twin of Uranus, and the blue color is, again, mostly from methane. We can see the banding of the atmosphere here, so you can also tell that Neptune rotates standing up, not kicked over like Uranus. What else can you notice? Let's see if I can make my cursor go to the right place. There is this kind of blue spot here. And uh, it reminded us a bit of Jupiter's great red spot. Now, this is an image from Voyager 2, which is the only time we ever actually went to Neptune. The Hubble was not yet in service, so it was several years until the Hubble telescope could look. And when it did, that spot had essentially vanished. Now, since then, we've watched other storms come and go. So we haven't seen anything last 300 years. Neptune's cloud tops are about the coldest place in the solar system at minus 361 degrees Fahrenheit, brr. It's also got the fastest winds in the solar system, 1,300 miles an hour. So we don't wanna even talk about that wind chill. Now it takes so long to orbit the sun, almost 165 years, that we have only watched Neptune make one orbit since its discovery in 1846. And it was actually discovered not by people looking for it on photographs, they actually found it with math, which is really cool. 
And uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is in space, in orbit around the Earth, still taking gorgeous pictures. Now, as you can see, it's kind of tough to look at the Neptune from here, right? It's a long way off. So right there is so much better view. Now Voyager showed us some of these shadows from, you can see the shadowing on the clouds, right? It makes this image very three-dimensional. You can see those cloud tops sticking up higher than the rest of the atmosphere. And of course, there were other surprises. So we had, boy, who knows who that is? All right, ignore the music in the background. It's a cool tune though. Um, so yeah, rings, that was fun. All four of the large gas planets have rings, which is really surprising, I guess. Now, they're hard to study from Earth because we just really can't see them. Thin and somewhat clumpy in spots, the best images are still from 1989. And, of course, moons, right? Today we have 14 moons named after minor water deities, one of which is almost the same size as Pluto. Now, way out here in the solar system, really, how could we have anything but a bunch of craters? Now, we were flying by too fast to see all of it, but Triton was a surprise. A surface with frozen nitrogen, right? A crust, apparently mostly water ice over a rocky core. Geysers of nitrogen gas contributing to just a whiff of atmosphere. Triton is the only large moon in the solar system to orbit a planet in the opposite direction from the planet's rotation. That's why scientists believe that it formed elsewhere and was captured by Neptune. It actually appears to belong to the same group of objects famously represented by our next destination. We do have a stone for Neptune. So you're going to start right next to that sugar maple tree that I told you about at the overflow parking lot. And okay, guys. Okay. 242 paces to Pluto. So we're walking all the way back up the Nature Center Drive, passing the bur oak tree on the left. By the way, deer hang out there at night, so be careful if you're in the park at night. It is a great dark destination though, so it's a great place for dark skies at night. That's one of the wonderful things about Warner Park. It's a sanctuary not only during the day, but at night. And we've got many, many programs talking about uh, the night activity that takes place here with owls and flying squirrels. Melissa has just talked about poor Pluto, and I actually have a quote from Mr. Will Chamberlain on our staff. He says, Pluto voted out of the solar system after years of faithful service. I think that's, that's pretty appropriate. Theo, do you want to go ahead and, and talk to us about Theo and, uh, excuse me, no, Pluto, and why um, Pluto isn't thought of as a planet anymore. All right, so right here, boom, we're at Pluto. And you notice how we only, we started all the way out there with Uranus, and then we walked all the way back to the Nature Center, only passing Neptune and Pluto. So Uranus is halfway between the Sun and Pluto. It's just a long way out there in the outer solar system. Well, okay, this is the best image that we can do from Earth using the Hubble Space Telescope. That's pretty good, though, because the discovery image, it was just a dot. The only way we knew it was a planet is that it moved against the background stars. So we fired up the fastest spacecraft we had ever launched and used Jupiter as a slingshot, and it was still a nine-and-a-half-year voyage. And when we left, Pluto was still a planet. <laughs> so there's Pluto up close. It's not a cratered rock out there in distant space. Mountains and valleys and glaciers, a thin atmosphere. What a fascinating small world. Now, is it a planet? Okay, so when it was discovered in 1930, it was the only item out this far. But beginning in 1992, we began to find other small bodies in that space out beyond Neptune. And, you know, one thing, okay, maybe that's just another planet, two things, three things, but now we have over 2,000 objects out there. So this happened actually to the asteroids as well. When we found one or two, they were planets for 30 or 40 years. And then we finally had to say, okay, when there's a million of them, we're going to have another grouping for this stuff. So Pluto now becomes the biggest member, or one of the biggest members, 
of a group of objects called the Kuiper Belt, which is like the asteroid belt, except everything out past Neptune. So it's, most of them aren't round like Pluto and its fellow dwarf planet buddies, but hey, a dwarf planet is still a planet, and we still love Pluto, right? It's not going anywhere. It's still the same lovable frozen ice ball it's always been. And judging from the heart there on the, the front of Pluto, Pluto likes us too. Now, this was as good as we could do in the 70s. And believe it or not, an astronomer noticed this cute little bulge here on the one picture on the left. And he noticed that that bulge moved over time around Pluto. And that actually led him to say, hey, Pluto has a moon. Well, good thing we got the Hubble Space Telescope. So we could actually see that separation between Pluto and Charon. It's really large moon. It's the better part of the size of Pluto itself. Now, while the New Horizons spacecraft was traveling, other moons were being discovered. Turns out Pluto has a total of five. So here are the three largest, Charon, which is actually really big. And then you can see how small Nix and Hydra are. Okay. And then here's all five to scale. where We had to put Charon as just an arc across the bottom and then the other four to scale with each other. Styx is named for a river in Hades, not the band. And Kerberos, the dog who guards the entrance to the underworld. Okay, so you can see that we have kind of a theme going here for, for Pluto. Now, Charon is so large that not only does it orbit Pluto like our moon, facing the planet with one side, but Pluto also faces Charon with one side. One side of Pluto always sees this moon, the other side never does. That's kind of fun. This is just a gorgeous picture. The long shadows of the mountains of ice, the visible layers of atmosphere. Pluto is currently moving out from the sun. Much of this may freeze back onto the surface till Pluto comes back around a bit closer. We're now standing over 3 billion miles from home. Wow, looking back, the sun is a thousand times dimmer from Pluto, just an eye-burning bit of light. Every planet is unique and beautiful in its own light, but now it's time to return to Earth and maybe think a little bit about some questions you have. And I think that uh, Heather has yet another question for you. I do have a question. Um... Mr. Will, that I mentioned a few minutes ago, yes, he did teach at Lipscomb, he taught at Peabody, and he is now on our staff at the Nature Center. So to answer that question from earlier, um, let's see. I wanted everybody to know, I see some people are starting to drop off because it's 11 o'clock. I wanted everybody to know that this um, entire presentation has been recorded and you will receive a YouTube link that has um, Theo's contact information, her home phone, right? No, not her home phone, but her uh, email, her email address. So that if you have more questions, you can contact her. We've also added um, the website for Barnard Seyfried Astronomical Society, the local astronomy club in Nashville, um, so that you can, you can check them out. Another really great um, resource for astronomy in Nashville is Dyer Observa Observatory, that's D-Y-E-R. Um, and before anybody else leaves, I wanted to tell you we have, oh, thank you, Cammie. The, uh, the email, uh, the, excuse me, website for Dyer is in the chat. And also, if you're interested, interested, we have another virtual star party coming up on February the 20th. Now, before we go, before we go, um, I did want to share one more poll. One of the reasons that we can see a lot of these things from our own backyards, um, and especially at Warner Park, is because of dark skies. One of the reasons that Warner Park has owls and flying squirrels and everything is because of dark skies. And there's some dark skies legislation coming up before Metro Council in February. So I wanted to see if you guys would just take one last poll for me. And you'll see it in a minute. There you go. 
how will you contribute to dark skies? And you can do more than one of these things. Turn off unused outside lights, share information about dark sky lighting, learn about animals that depend on dark skies. And by the way, we have a hike during the next full moon, I believe it's in January, to see uh, dark skies here in Warner Park. Investigate a dark sky friendly lighting uh, for my house or, or business, and just enjoy being outside. I'm going to go ahead and end this poll. I think everybody has submitted and share the results. I think everybody is really interested in dark skies, Theo, just like we are. So thank you all for taking a walk with us. Um, again, I have all of this information to share via email. If you're interested, just uh, let us know at WPNC. That's uh, Warner Park Nature Center at national.gov. And you can also reach Theo at the email address on the, um, the screen. Tammy has just added um, our schedule link in the chat. So if you want to check out what else we've got going on at Warner Park this winter, please do that. And Theo, anything? Anything? Anything, yeah. anything else? Um, go outside, enjoy the sky, and yeah, turn off your outdoor lights. You know, the more light you can get out of your own eyes, the more you will see at night. So have fun. It's a great socially distanced thing to do these days. Um, and hopefully you can see things you didn't know were out there. Everybody have a great day. Come by and see us at the Nature Center. We're here until 4, but Warner Parks are open until 11 p.m. at night. So come out and enjoy the night sky.